Welcome to the Design 30 podcast. In this podcast, I provide design tools and strategies to improve creativity, innovation, and overall design confidence. And in addition to that, I also like to provide people with the ability to see design in the world. And hopefully when I talk about these different design principles or rules or strategies, you're going out and uh, looking in the world. And in your daily lives, you're seeing different ways that these rules come into play. Maybe you're understanding better why uh, different products are designed the way they are. Uh, Things like that. That's the goal of this podcast. Um, As always, please follow the Design 30 podcast on Instagram, as well as on YouTube. And I also have a Substack and actually just released a new article on Substack a couple days ago. Uh, Those are typically pretty quick, uh, typically between three to five minutes, uh, sometimes a little bit longer to read through them. So if you want just a little weekly, at this point, it's more of a monthly dose of of a design tool or strategy, uh, go ahead and subscribe to that. And if you would like to support what I'm doing or support the podcast, you can become a paid subscriber to the Substack. And with that, let's dive into today's episode. Many of us don't spend much time thinking about the things around us, how they were designed, or why they have the shape and perhaps why they are located where they're located. Uh, But once you start to look into these things, you realize there's a lot of intention behind all of it. Uh, There's a lot of design strategy and a lot of design principles that are implemented by the engineers and the designers behind these products. Uh, You see that certain things are made to be low cost, other things are made to be more durable. Uh, Some products are designed to be very intuitive and easy to use. And then other ones are designed more with safety in mind, trying to keep the user safe or perhaps other people safe. So there's reason for the different shapes, the different colors, and the different materials that are used for products. If you ever worked with large equipment or perhaps worked in a wood shop or metal shop, uh, you've likely noticed that much of the equipment has these large red emergency stop buttons. And have you ever taken a moment to just dissect uh, the design of these buttons? Have you spent a moment thinking about the size of them, where they're located on the machines, uh, perhaps why they're colored red? Why are they so big? What What is uh, the rationale behind the location of them being usually within arm's reach? Well, all of it may seem somewhat obvious. Uh, it's You look at it and you think, well, it's designed that way because it makes it easy to push, makes it easy to find. Um, It's a safety button, so obviously you want to be able to push it easily. Um, But taking that a step further, you may start to ask questions like, why do I think it's easy to find? Why do I think it's easy to push or to press the button? What design elements or strategies are being used by the designers and the engineers for these products to accomplish this ease of use that seems so obvious to me, the user. Well, one such uh, design element is called Fitz Law. And this law states that the time required to move to a target is a function of the target size and distance to the target. Again, this sounds fairly obvious and it is in a lot of ways, but it can easily be overlooked in a lot of our designs. It's almost so simple that you don't even think about it. And sometimes that leads to a poor design. So Fitz Law also has a formula associated with it. And this formula is T equals A plus B times the log base two of D over W plus one. And if you're someone who is not mathematically minded, that probably sounded like a bunch of gibberish. And even if you are, it's probably hard to make sense of what I just said. So let's go through that in a little bit more detail. Again, this is a formula for Fitz law, which is saying the time required to move to a target is a function of the target size and the distance to that target. 
So putting that in plain English, uh, again, it sounds obvious, but a target that is larger and closer is going to be easier to acquire. Or let's go to a real world example. A button that is larger and closer to you, it's gonna take less time for you to hit that button than if it's farther away and if it's smaller. So going back to this equation, T equals A plus B times log base two of D over W plus one. So T in this case is time. So obviously this whole equation, do the math and you get how much time it takes to press a button at a certain distance, which is what the D stands for. And the target needs to be of a certain size or it has a size to it, which is the W. And right now the A and the B in this equation, they're constants that are determined more by the situation. So for example, whether you're using your hand to hit the target or the button, whether you're using a stylus or a pen, or perhaps even something like a laser pointer. So there are these constants that can be tuned uh, depending on the situation. But what's more important is looking at the D over W. So D is distance to the target and W is the width of the target. And since it's D on the top and W on the bottom, that means if your distance gets larger, then the time it takes to press that button or to acquire that target is going to take longer. And if the W, which is on the bottom, is larger, then it's gonna take less time. Or if the distance is smaller, I think you get the picture. So the main elements of this are the distance and the size of the target or the width of the target. So this shows why adjusting distance or size affects the time it takes to acquire, to acquire the target. And looking back at the e-stop design, this should seem or should be fairly obvious at this point now, even though it was obvious before, but now there's at least a formula uh, to help explain why it's so obvious of, that they place the e-stop in the location they typically do and why it's usually larger than other buttons or controls on the system. So they make it a large design so that it's easy to see and find, and it's also nearby, thus reducing the time it takes to actually get to the button and press it. And of course, in an emergency situation, time is incredibly important, and you also don't want people to make errors. So reducing the distance and increasing the size also reduces the, the errors, or in this case, the error would be someone missing the button or having to feel around to locate the button, something like that. There are a few other situations I wanna go through where Fitz Law uh, can be applied. The first one is obviously Fitz Law is more of a UI or user interface design uh, idea or strategy. And so if you're coming from that background, this is probably something you've heard of quite a bit and maybe you've even implemented it in your own designs. But it's used a lot in UI designs for browsers or websites, uh, apps, things like that. So you can think of it as the time it takes to get a cursor on the target or to get your finger on the correct button. And this is a huge factor in the user experience of your, of your app or your browser, your website, whatever the case might be. So a quick example, uh, think of the location of a toolbar for most applications or browsers on your computer. Uh, having each menu near the top, because that toolbar is typically near the top of your screen or right at the top of it, it makes it impossible if you're moving your mouse, your cursor to that button or to the toolbar to overshoot it because you're going to hit the top of your screen and stop. So having the menu near that, the top of your screen essentially increases the size of your target because you can't overshoot it. So you can just keep pushing your mouse as far as you can up and watch your cursor go up towards the top of the screen. It's just going to hit and it's going to stop. So this greatly, uh, as I said, increases the effective size of the button, therefore reduces the time it takes to acquire the target or to click the correct button in the toolbar. And it still takes some time to horizontally, horizontally adjust, um, which is called homing movement. This is where you're, uh, you know, you might overshoot something or you might have to move slightly to the left to get to the right button on the toolbar, move slightly to the left, 
uh, one way or the other. And that's called a homing movement. So it's kind of fine tuning once you get close to the target. And just uh, some other terminology real quick. The initial movement where you're moving perhaps from the bottom of the screen to the top, that's called a ballistic movement. And it's usually a straight line movement where you're not stopping. It doesn't have to be smooth. It's kind of a quick uh, uh, jerky movement to approximately the right location. And then you have a homing movement where you home in on that uh, whatever button you're trying to press. So another important note while we're discussing this in the context of UI, uh, Fitz law only applies to rapid movements to a specific location. So it's not so much about a continuous drawing or sketching type of movement. So if you're creating an app where people sketch and draw, uh, at least that aspect of the app, Fitz law won't apply to that. However, when they're clicking other buttons in the UI, maybe changing pencils or saving, things like that, definitely Fitz law will apply there. So let's go to one other example that is not a UI example necessarily, or at least it's not a application or web browser, not related to computers, a little bit more of a physical world problem. Me being a mechanical engineer, obviously I really like these physical world issues and designs and how to approach those and how to apply uh, UI and UX principles into physical products. So this example is the uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee from the mid 1990s. So in these vehicles, they actually moved the brake and gas pedals slightly over to the left, which was uh, in reaction to some changes they had made to the transmission, and it was either the size of the location of the transmission required that the brake and gas pedals had to be moved slightly to the left. And so instead of being to the right of the center line of the steering wheel, which you may or may not notice, but if you are in your car right now, just think about where your gas pedal is at and where your brake pedal is at. And they are typically uh, per normal convention, slightly to the right of the center line of that steering wheel. And this makes it easy for your right foot to control both pedals. But in these Jeep Grand Cherokees, they had to move it slightly more to the left. So the brake pedal ended up being slightly to the left of the center line of the steering wheel. And so this is farther away from the right foot. And it's also different than most other vehicles that we're used to driving. So this led to a significant spike in unintended accelerations. So there was more user error. People were either one, uh, not able to find their brake pedal, at least not as quickly, or two, confusing their brake pedal with the accelerator. And this led to a lot of injuries. Uh, in some cases, I think a few people were killed. So very dire consequences for this change that probably seemed somewhat simple when it was first made. Um, and here's a good time to talk about another aspect of Fitz law, which is that error motion or this idea of missing your target will also occur more frequently if the distance is increased or the size is reduced. And you can understand this intuitively. If you have a small button on something you're using, it usually takes a little while. Sometimes you'll miss it the first time. You'll kind of have to slide your finger over or maybe just press once, press twice. It takes a little while to actually get that button pressed. And if it's farther away, you might move your hand a little too quick and overshoot it, or maybe more likely with your feet, you might move it a little too quickly and overshoot your target and then have to come back and readjust. And so not only is the ballistic motion that we mentioned earlier, which is straight line motion, lengthened, it also requires more homing motion, which is this fine tuning, small adjustment sort of motion to find the target. So in the Jeeps, people were taking longer to find the brake pedal or flat out missing it and hitting the gas pedal instead, which had these dire consequences. And you can look at some graphs of these accidental acceleration incidents or unintentional acceleration incidents. And you can see in the early 90s, there's a few of them, not very many. And then in 93, 94, 95, there's just this massive spike 
which many people believe uh, is correlated with this design change in the location of the brake pedal and gas pedal. And they did a lot of other tests to see if it was other issues with the vehicle. Uh, maybe it was um, cruise control issues or water messing with the electronics, uh, but nothing else really proved to, uh, to show why this was happening. And so this issue of the brake pedal being slightly different, gas pedal being slightly more to the left, uh, many people believe actually caused these issues. So as these examples show, um, our understanding of Fitt's law can drastically improve uh, the user experience of a product that we design. And more importantly, it can drastically improve the safety of that product. And so let's review this one more time. So what is Fitt's law? The law states the time required to move to a target is a function of the target size and the distance to the target. So a simple way to think about this is smaller and further equals longer, larger and closer equals fast. So something that is smaller and further away from you or further from your cursor, something like that, it's gonna take longer to actually hone in on that button and press it or acquire your target. And then if it's larger and closer, we all intuitively understand this, it's gonna be pretty easy to reach, press that button. And sometimes this isn't crucial and Fitt's law can be overridden by aesthetics or other factors. For example, right before I started recording this podcast, I was looking at my toilet and thinking about the handle on the toilet. Pretty simple and it's pretty easy to use. But I was thinking, well, what if it was a little bit smaller and what if it was located at the bottom of the toilet? I don't know why you would do that, but functionally you could probably make it work. Wouldn't it be a big deal? But the user experience of it would be awful. You'd have to reach over and oh no, around a toilet, which is usually not that clean. You kind of have to grope around for this lever to flush your toilet. And so that's going to drastically reduce your user experience. And then I was thinking, well, why not make it significantly larger? And here's where aesthetics usually come into play. So obviously it would be easy if you made that lever, you know, let's say a foot long, make it bright red and have it located right at the top. However, usually people want to have a nice aesthetic in their bathroom. They want things to look good and having this giant red lever, which would actually look like an emergency lever of some kind, probably isn't what you want on your toilet. So that's where we end up with these, you know, one to two inch long levers. They're easy to use. They're located right at the top, usually close to where your hand is at. Makes it really functional as well as aesthetic. So the Fitz law isn't necessarily something you need to apply in every single situation, uh, but it should always be considered and something that if you optimize it, can drastically improve user interaction and user experience. So the Design 30 discipline for this week is a pretty simple one. I want you to go about your week as normal, but look for different locations or maybe different applications on your computer, on your phone, where Fitz Law comes into play. And simply identify those three designs where it's implemented well, or perhaps where it's implemented poorly. And maybe just take a few notes on it. Uh, think through well, what would happen if this target or button or whatever the case might be, it would, if it was smaller or if it was farther away, what would, what would be the implication? How would that impact my user experience? And that will do it for today's episode. I hope this was uh, helpful for you and something that you can take away and help you understand the design of things around you, as well as help you improve your own design skills. As always, thanks for listening this week. And remember, design more, despair less.